The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The big issues between Canada and Indigenous people are neither abstract nor resolved. They're also very immediate and challenging for local leaders. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. As we recall important conversations from past seasons, tonight a chance to hear again how four Ontario chiefs work daily to resolve some of the intractable problems in their communities. For many of us, having access to clean water may not be front of mind. But as of this past May, there are 52 long-term drinking water advisories in effect in 33 different Indigenous communities. 107 long-term drinking water advisories have been lifted since November of 2015. We initially taped this discussion in June of 2017. Scugog First Nation was on the cusp of rectifying a drinking water advisory that had been in place since 2008. The boil water advisory is still in effect. The boil water advisory for Curve Lake First Nation is also still in effect. Within Indigenous communities, chief is a leadership position that can be inherited or elected, and some First Nations have both. Here is our conversation from 2017 with four chiefs from across Southern Ontario. I want to start off just going around the table here with each one of you individually to try to understand your particular part of our world a little better. And uh, Chief Lynn, I'm going to start with you. Where is Chiging on Manitoulin Island? Chiging is in the heart of Manitoulin Island. It is uh, one of six communities on the island. North Channel, North, North Sound, Channel, right? Georgian Bay. About halfway beautiful along. Beautiful location. Eh? It is beautiful, I'll grant you that. How many people are you responsible for? We have a membership listing of approximately 2,600 people, and it fluctuates 2,600, 2,700 people. And what do you see as your mission as the chief of Chiging? To listen to the people, to serve the people to the best of my abilities, from babies to elders, and especially for those who are are on their way to coming. Chief Mary, you ready to go? Yep. Where is your First Nation? Um, <clears throat> Bosley First Nation is located on the southern tip of Georgian Bay, uh, southern of Manitoulin Island. Um, we have a population of approximately 2,500 members, uh, 800 of which live um, in the community on the island. And what do you see as your mission as the chief? My mission, uh, like uh, Chief de Bozaguet, is to listen to the people and um, uh, do do what I can to um, make it a better community. Uh, one of the main missions for me is obviously trying to get a new ferry for the community. Um, that's a, one of the biggest pressing issues that we're facing right now, um, along with um, trying to uh, promote and expand our economic development and things of that nature to provide more opportunities and such for our people. Gotcha. Thank you. Chief Kelly, how about you? Where is Scugog Island? Scugog First Nation is on the northernmost point of Scugog Island in Port Perry, Ontario. Uh, we have, uh, I think our membership list is up to 278. 278. Small but mighty. <laughs> um, we have approximately 100 people on reserve with their families, and then the rest of the membership are spread out across Canada with a high concentration in and around Vancouver, actually. And so. what do you see as your mission? Uh, my mission is to represent the interests of all the people uh, fairly in a fair-minded way. I want to listen to my people, as do the other chiefs, obviously. Uh, I want to secure a financial future for my community and um, really be a role model to the youth and uh, give them a future that's bright and full of pride. Gotcha. One last question. What are you holding in your hand? Uh, it's a tobacco tie, so when I speak with it, it gives me a bit of, um, a bit of calming. Gotcha. <laughs> Okay, Chief Phyllis, where's Curve Lake? Curve Lake is uh, just north of Peterborough. We're on a peninsula uh, between Buckhorn and Chemong Lakes. Um, and we are very much part of the, the beautiful Kawarthas. How many people? We have about 1,600 currently. But uh, with, with that, there's an additional uh, few that are occupying our territory through leases. So they lease mm -hmm. the, the land. Uh, and uh, contribute to the, the, um, the, uh, the need to maintain some of our, our roads, policing, et cetera. 
I see. Yes. And your mission, what do you see it as? I, I, much like our, our women here, we, we need to listen to our people. Um, for us, it's, it's about development right now. We, we have a growing population and we need to ensure that our children and, and youth are, are part of that growth and, and their, their uh, future is, is certainly uh, accommodating, you know, from the perspective of our, of our leadership. And uh, for us, uh, we are a boil water community, boil water advisory community. How so How long have you been that? We have been uh, having lots of efforts in terms of addressing things for 20 years. 20 years? 20 years, yes. So um, that development is hindered by the, the fact that we don't have the good quality water for sure. that we need. More on that to come. Yes. Gotcha. Chief Kelly, what is, in your view, the number one issue that you're facing right now? Um, much like Chief Phyllis in the Curve Lake community, we're under a boil water advisory. Um, we've been under a permanent drinking water advisory since 2008. Um, but before that time, we were under many repeated uh, BWAs um, since, gosh, the, ne the early 90s. So being a community in Durham Region and an hour and a half northeast of Toronto, I was it's quite say, unheard of. You, you are not that far from this studio and you're having to boil water. Yes. How does that make any sense at all? N none, none at all. Um, Indian Affairs, as I call them, I'm some Ministry of Indigenous Affairs, pardon me. Renamed, uh, yes. Renamed. Um, Indian Affairs has, has um, been involved with us in our boil water, water struggles as well as Health Canada, but they've taken their sweet time in getting the money out. The answer I keep hearing back is uh, that the policies within the department do not match the political promises made by the governing party. So I don't see that as a good enough reason. However, I do believe uh, we are on the cusp of coming to some kind of a, an agreement or an arrangement with the federal government. What gives you that confidence um, right now? Uh, that's why I'm being uh, informed of unofficially, so I can't uh, quite, uh, quite make it official yet. And until I see something in writing, it isn't official. Now, we've heard 20 <laughs> years over here for boil water advisories. How about for you? Yeah, so since in and around 1992 for the boil water advisories at Scugog, but a permanent drinking water advisory, which is the sort of next level of severity since 2008. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, do, how, how do people manage? Um, we, we bring in water. We have pump houses that we service. We hire qualified water operators and do our best, basically. And, uh, and as a community, we support our members um, with bringing in bottled water and thing, the things that they need. Hmm. But uh, it's pretty tough. And I have a two-year-old baby, and I can't wait to have clean water in the community for her and all of our kids and our elderly people who just, I mean, all of my people need it, obviously. It's a human right. It's hugely concerning. Hmm. Chief Phyllis, uh, I want to, you, you talked to us about the boil water advisory already. What other issues are huge for you at the moment? I think settling our claims is, is a huge issue and, and that's one of the topics our community uh, continue to uh, um, call my office about and or raise in, in our, our uh, meetings, our annual meetings and our, our periodic meetings. They keep saying, when is our, our flooded claim going to be resolved? When is our uh, Williams Treaty going to be resolved? I think treaties and, and the, the agreements that the government have made in the past, um, they're long standing and there is obviously uh, uh, nothing happening, nothing to be um, made right mm -hmm. with all the wrongs that have happened. So you feel very much dependent, am I saying this right, on the government of Canada to sort of make things right? Absolutely. Many promises have been made, uh, especially with this government, and we're still waiting. We, we absolutely need to have some of those supports in our community. Okay, the, I gotta say the conventional wisdom on the Trudeau government is of course they, they immediately said yes to all of the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And you know, what I hear fed back to me frequently is the tone is much better. There is a minister who you know, is on the case and who cares, um, but you're saying we're still waiting to see evidence. Is that right? are, I, I guess I, I need to remind uh, people that uh, these are calls to action. We have yet to see the action. You've it, heard the call. It's, it's not enough to be on paper. Hmm. We need to see the results of those uh, recommendations. You say flooding has been an issue for you? Flooding has been an issue. How did that happen in the first place? Uh, the Trent Severn waterway system, again, a, a Canada uh, initiative. So um, islands that belong to Skugog First Nation, 
Hiawatha First Nation and Curve Lake First Nation have been flooded. And that, while that was settled, our mainland, our community, has lost, um, you know, quite a bit of acreage around its, its prime area. So a mega project of Canada flooded your land. Yes. And you have been without compensation for that so far? Correct. So you'd like to see that dealt with too sweet. Absolutely. Gotcha. Okay, Chief Mary, how about you? Uh, uh, well, let me, let me uh, get more direct here. All over the country, in every community, we see issues of drug addiction, we see issues of youth alienation, we see issues of suicide, we see issues of mental health, and we're told these issues are all far more urgent on reserve. Is this your experience as well? Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, a lot of the communities share a lot of those, those types of problems. Um, <clears throat> you know, and it's not the easiest thing to, you know, to try and resolve overnight, you know, like things aren't going to happen, you know, just like that. Um, I, you know, we can do what we can as leadership to try and drive um, that particular agenda, but really it comes down to the entire community and wanting to make that change and try to address the, the root causes of those issues and you, tackle them. Do you see that there? Do you see that desire there to address the oh, root causes? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Our, um, actually, our youth council um, is uh, very active in, you know, trying to promote that. And um, they've recently contacted the We Matter campaign um, to come and facilitate a workshop in our community to um, do that. Um, uh, the We Matter campaign is uh, fairly new. Um, I think it's about a year old, but it was started by uh, a couple of kids from Hay River um, Northwest Territories, and they just go out and um, <clears throat> they try to uh, promote uh, uh, life promotion. Is, it is what they do. Um, yeah, they um, they get all kinds of like I guess they have videos and stuff like that that they uh, promote and share with Indigenous youth across the country. And what they're doing now is, uh, from what I understand, is they're going into communities and actually training other youth within those communities to host these types of workshops so that they can carry those out in the region. So uh, it's 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 pretty good, and I think um, having youth driving that is important. Okay. Let's talk. Youth uh, listen to youth. So indeed, yeah. indeed. Chief Linda, let's talk economy. Twenty-five hundred people in your part of the province. What do they do for a living? Um, we have actually have a high unemployment rate. Um, our lo our largest employer is the First Nation administration itself. Um, we we have uh, we have a band operated school, which employs a significant amount of individuals as well. Um, the economy on Manitoulin Island is is very poor. Um, in earlier years, it, it, the, it was an economy based on tourism. Obviously, we're on, on an island and ha only have one bridge to, for access. One bridge and one ferry. 24 hour, tw or 12 months a year and, yeah. a, and a ferry for four or five months a year. Mm -hmm. um, and with the economy in general, the Canadian and American economy, which used to drive the tourism on Manitoulin Island, has, has declined over the years. So we, we face, uh, you know... We're starting to face significant poverty levels. I think when we talk about economy, we have to look back at where we came from to where we um, are at today. Um, history, history of my community was our resources were, our economy was vast with fishing, uh, making maple syrup, making sugar, um, f some forestry. Um, Any of that still happen? Very minimal, very minimal. Um, our land base is very small. So we don't have the land um, to do those economic ventures. Now, here's the thing. If things aren't working well in a particular community, they leave. They go somewhere else mm -hmm. where, there's, where there is work. I and mean, that's a, been a story of many people over the years. Mm -hmm. Because of your attachment to the land, that's not an option for you, right? No. So you've got to make it work where you are. That's right. How tough is that to do? It's tough. Um, our traditional territory is very large, but our community can't just pick up and go there. History tells us that Manitoulin Island was once to be a reserve for the Indians, the whole of Manitoulin. When the settlers came and found um, good farming land, good access to the Great Lakes, that's when Indian Affairs came in again and um, the superintendent at the time uh, signed a treaty with, with the First Nations. And, and the history of that treaty um, is that there was a huge miscommunication. My, my family is a signatory to that treaty and our, 
our oral history tells us that what was communicated then on that paper was not communicated verbally. Hmm. So you have two nations, one that is fluently uh, Ojibwe Odawa, Potawatomi dialect speaking, Anishinaabek, to a uh, English speaking country. So our understanding was we will we will live in peaceful coexistence with each other. And you can come and live with us, but you cannot dig deeper than the, the depth of a plow. And, ex, and ex, in exchange of that, um, the Crown will ensure that you and your families for generations to come will be taken care of. And I guess you're still waiting for that treaty to be made we're good still, on it. We're still waiting. Still waiting. Yeah. How many years? Um, you know, since the beginning of time, since the arrival, since the arrival, Steve. Multiple generations, Multiple generations, 300 years, something like that, eh? Even more than that, right? When, when we look at the land base of Canada, um, particularly here in Ontario, um, my family history tells me that my family, what, my family was involved from Lake Superior right down, right down to Lake Erie, Lake Ontario. Hmm. That's where they traveled. So that's a lot. It's huge. Gotcha. Uh, Chief Kelly, you got a casino near you? Yes. You got yes, any interest in that casino? We did. Uh, I'll explain a, a little bit, if sure. I may. Uh, the casino opens, it opened its doors in 1997. Which and originally, one? it's, sorry, the Great Blue Heron Charity Casino. Uh, feel free and come and sp spend some time there. Mm -hmm. uh, we opened, it opens it, its doors in 1997, and it was originally a hybrid facility. So the OLG had, um, well, I think in 2000, they brought their slot machines in. They conducted and managed the slot machines, and the Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation proudly conducted and managed the table games. Uh, it was a small boutique charity casino, and it has a certain regulatory framework uh, and, and legal framework around it, such that uh, not all the monies would directly come back to the community, per se. Uh, we uh, proudly struck up a charity and uh, chose to opt for the charity model in 1997. 100% of my community wanted the charitable model. And uh, we struck up a charity that's basically what the board was made of our members. And uh, has it has given away, gosh, um, since 1997, I think it's over, at, at least over, I think, two million, two and a half million, um, into the Durham region and local economy. So that uh, is something, a point of pride for my community. But I'm just, I've been mindful of the fact that um, you know, people probably wonder, well, why if you have a casino, wouldn't you have clean water? And that's a valid question. Uh, one that I've been scratching my head about since coming on council. But to be honest, um, the Crown was a fiduciary duty, which we obviously choose to make the Crown uphold. And we've been working with uh, the federal government in that vein. I don't have the expectation necessarily that the federal government would pay for our entire water treatment facility. Um, I've been wanting to work with them and in order to do that, I've had to conduct various studies and testing over time to gather data to satisfy their policies. And that has taken decades to do and was started before I became chief and really got underway, I would say, in 2014. Uh, so in 2014, we started the studies, and again, I'm, I'm on, hopeful we're on the cusp of clean water. Uh, but we're I digress. Into we're into jurisdictional stuff here, though. That it's casino money goes to the province. Yes. And the money you need to fix your water is federal money. Right. So we have a disconnect here. Yes, there very, very much there is one. Um, I, I'd also like to say, um, I believe it was, when did we sign those agreements? Um, 20, 2015, I think. Uh, we, we signed some new gaming agreements. Now the, the facility is a commercial one, so the whole conduct and manage authority is resting with the OLG and the provincial with government. With the provincial government, yeah. Um, that be came out as a, a host of regulatory changes under the uh, charitable gaming regulations. Mm -hmm. So uh, we decided to opt in that route under OLG's modernization plan that's now underway. But, um, but are you getting a piece of that action? Uh, we do have a revenue sharing agreement, mm. thankfully, and uh, it was as a result of a couple of years of hard negotiations. Are you satisfied you. with that agreement? Um, satisfied, I think that would be the word. Okay, <laughs> bringing adequate revenues into the community? Just adequate, Just yes. adequate, okay, Yes, Fair enough. indeed. There is obviously in politics in this country a lot more male leadership than female leadership, and I want to explore for a few minutes here whether there's a difference. Okay, Chief Williams, what do you see? 
Um, I have to mention and honor the fact that our uh, first woman chief in Canada came from Curve Lake, Chief Elsie Knott. I'm the second elected ch uh, woman chief in Curve Lake. So there was a, a big span there. Um, I, I don't, I think women are, are taking uh, um, their rightful place. I think the fact that, you know, yes, we can run a household and yes, we can do other things, uh, be teachers, lawyers, etc. But I think there's a place for us in, in politics. I think there's a place where we need to have our voice. The fact that uh, um, women are becoming more and more leaders um, is, is, is significant. And, and I think, you know, being part of those as chiefs assemblies and such, I see more people going to the microphones and, and having that voice. In Ontario, I think the last count I, I, I uh, researched was that there was about 41 women chiefs in Ontario and about 128 across Canada. Out of how many First Nations? 634 across Canada and 133, four? Yes, so in Ontario. Disproportionately low still. It's still low. Yeah. But our voice is, is significantly there. Chief Mary, can I ask you if you've run into sexism on the job? Um, I can't say that I have. Um, I think um, there's been, it's been pretty respectful in terms of that, um, in terms of me being a female and being a leader. I, I haven't run into um, any of those sorts of issues. Um, I think um, in my community in particular, I, uh, when I was running for the elected position, um, there was a real push for female to, um, to take the lead again. Um, and like Chief Phyllis, um, I'm the second woman leader. The one before me was uh, former Chief Valerie Minaig, and uh, she has been you know, one of my mentors throughout the years. And um, I was very lucky to have her kind of plow the path for the women leaders that are going to follow her. Chief Linda, I want to ask you, you have a bit of a, well, I guess, OK, this is a terrible question for me to ask. But you and I know each other a little yes. bit, so I'm going to ask yes. it already. How old are you? I just turned 35. OK, so you're not only dealing with potentially issues around gender, but maybe around your relatively young age as well. 35 is a very young age to be the leader of anything. Mm -hmm. uh, any issues around either of those things? At the beginning, I mean, in like um, my, my fellow colleagues here, I, I am the second uh, elected female chief in my community. The first was uh, former Chief Isadora Bebamosh, um, who still is a, is a pillar in our community, and I look up to her very much as well. Um, when I, when I ran for this position, that was a question of the community. Is she old enough? Is she strong enough? Can she do this? Mm. Um, part of my own growing up and history is that I've always worked hard. I've always uh, um, attempted to overachieve anything I've ever put my mind to. And I always made sure I fit in somewhere. But you did get those questions, eh? I did. I did. And I still, I do as well today. I get comments from... Um, federal government officials, I get comments from provincial government officials. Um, I, but from just general people, um, they're, they're pretty supportive. Do My you, community is also very supportive now. Um, I feel that um, since I now have uh, about a year and a half under my belt, mm. um, prior to that I was a counselor and I was very active, I was very vocal. And I continue to do so at, uh, within our provincial um, territorial meetings as well as the national, the national meetings. Do you find yourself having to act, for lack of a better word, kind of tougher in order to overcome whatever prejudices people may have? About I, do, I do have to assert myself to some degrees. Um, usually those are at initial meetings. After that, it's gone. Got After it. that, it's completely gone. Chief Kelly, how about you? Any issues around sexism in your job? Uh, it exists. Unfortunately, um, working within Scugog First Nation, however, it's been, I'd say, a wonderful experience. Um, we've had female chiefs since the 80s. So there was Yvonne Edgar and then Tracy Gauthier, who is uh, just retiring from the council now. And she's worked with me for years and uh, now myself. So and we've had other women on council as well, very strong leaders. So I, I feel that Scugog is very comfortable with the nature of female leadership. Um, in fact, 
I had a baby during my first tenure as chief. Uh, and they, saw, they, they acclaimed me back into the seat, which was a, a, real, a real honor and a gift. So you didn't have to run um, against anyone. I didn't anybody. have to run against anyone. Huh. And they had faith in my abilities, and I'm very grateful for that. So I'm, I feel very comfortable that they, they know that uh, women in leadership have a uh, multitude of responsibilities, and they've certainly given me license to do that. Did you um, want to add something? Yeah, I wanted to add something. I feel that as well, and I, I observe a lot as well in my, in my, in my role. Um, I feel that um, us as women leaders, I feel that we're challenged more. That's what I feel. I feel that we're, we're challenged a lot more than a, than a male. And I firmly believe that comes from um, the male-dominated political culture. And that's not um, hereditary or traditionally ours as Anishinaabe people. Mm -hmm. um, we all recognize that both male and female have roles in our communities. Um, women in our communities were always leaders. They were life givers. They, they did have decision-making skills. History tells us that it's the women who determined which men went to war. Hmm. So we are the heart of our communities. We are the reason, reasons why our communities exist in terms of life-giving life -giving bodies. So we do. I feel that um, my, uh, I guess my my feeling for my community is I'm very protective of it, of all people, whether they live on reserve or off reserve. And I, and I extend my hand to them. And I, I make myself available to people. I post my cell phone on Facebook. I put my cell phone everywhere. Yeah, you're so on that Twitter a lot too. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, all mm -hmm. different forms of social media. And I try to stay connected that way. Um, in my, my current role, the struggles I face is that I don't have an assistant. Unlike, if I make a compar comparison with provincial governments and my, my little government, mm -hmm. um, I don't have an assistant. I, I receive a bi-weekly honorarium. I don't pay into EI, CPP, pension, nothing. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we say we are gonna be true servants of the people, we are true servants of the people. It's not for, for me, it's not my benefit or gain. It's for theirs. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. Tomorrow, writer and public intellectual Thomas King on how artists have influenced debates about Indigenous issues and the relationship with Canada. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.